Consider what an advantage you once had against the temptations of the devil and the solicitations of the flesh and the world when your love for Christ was fresh and vigorous and how much the case is altered with you now, how feeble you present resistance of any sin. Surely you have cause to bemoan, oh, that I were as in months past, as in the days when God preserved me and when his candle shined upon my head. Job 29, 2 and 3 Remember from whence thou art fallen. Recall the mount of myrrh and the hill of frankincense, which once were trodden in fellowship with the eternal lover of your soul. Thomas Manton said, In our returning we should have such thoughts as these. I was wont to spend some time every day with God. It was a delight to me to think of Him, or speak of Him, or to Him. Now I have no heart to pray or meditate. It was the joy of my soul to wait upon His ordinances. The return of the Sabbath was welcome unto me, but now what a weariness is it. Time was when my heart did rise up in arms against sin, when a vain thought was a grief to my soul. Why is it so different with me now? Is sin grown less odious, or God less lovely? Unquote. Second, and repent. What is evangelical repentance? Its leading elements are conviction, contrition, and confession. Where real repentance is present in the heart, there is a true sense of sin, a sincere sorrow for sin, a hearty loathing of sin, and a holy shame for sin. It is called by many names in Scripture, such as the afflicting of our souls, Leviticus 16.29, humbling ourselves, 2 Chronicles 7.14, a broken heart, Psalm 51.17, a contrite spirit, Isaiah 66.2, a smiting upon the thigh, Jeremiah 31.19, mourning, Zechariah 12.10, weeping bitterly, Matthew 26.75. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance, Romans 2.4, which means, first, it is by His goodness that repentance is wrought in us by the gracious operations of His Spirit, and second, that it is the sense of His goodness which melts and breaks our hard and stubborn hearts. The convicted conscience is made to feel how vilely I have requited God for His great goodness to me, and thus sin is embittered to my soul. Thereby I am brought to take sides with God against myself and condemn my wicked wanderings from Him. So far from excusing my iniquities, I now accuse them. The heart is deeply affected by the exceeding sinfulness of sin and grieves for having offended my loving Lord, for disregarding and opposing my blessed benefactor, for having so evilly repaid him for having so little concern for his pleasure and honor. The soul will now sincerely confess its transgressions, not in a cold and formal way, but out of the abundance of the heart the mouth now speak. Oh, my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee. Ezra 9, 6 will be my language. True Christian repentance is the heart turning from sin and returning to God. In the hour of penitence, sin is hated and self is loathed. The deeper the repentance, the fuller will be the confession. There will be a detailed acknowledgement of our wicked conduct and emphasizing of the enormity of the evil course we have followed. As examples of this, let the reader turn to Daniel 9, 5 and 6, and Acts 26, 9 to 11, 
and observe how many aggravations of the sinning is there mentioned. Further, genuine repentance is always attended with sincere desires and earnest endeavors after reformation of life. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Proverbs 28.13 As sin is a forsaking of God, so repentance is a forsaking of sin. The language of a contrite soul is, What have I to do any more with idols? Hosea 14.8 Deeply humbling the the work of repentance be unto us, it is glorifying to God. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the God of Israel, and make confession unto him. Joshua 7.19 And if ye will not lay it to heart, to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you. Malachi 2.2 2. And they repented not to give him glory. Revelation 16.9 It must be so, for repentance is taking sides with God against sin. Oh, how each of us needs to pray for a deeper repentance. Painful though the work of repentance be, yet it issues in pleasant fruits. As one of the Puritans said, Groans unutterable, Make way for joys unspeakable. If we sorrowed more for sin, we would rejoice more in the Lord. But let us add that in cases where true penitents are so bound up within that they cannot pour out their souls in heart-melting confessions before the Lord, yet they can mourn over the hardness of their hearts and grieve because their sorrow is so shallow. Cowper penned these words, Where is the blessedness I knew when first I saw the Lord? Where is the soul-refreshing view of Jesus and His Word? What peaceful hours I then enjoyed, how sweet their memory still! But now I find an aching void the world can never fill. Return, O holy dove, return, sweet messenger of rest. I hate the sins that made thee mourn and drove thee from my breast. The dearest idol I have known, whate'er that idol be, help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. Third, and do the first works. Negatively, this means turn your back upon the world, re-enter the lists against Satan, resume the task of denying self and mortifying your members which are upon the earth. Positively, it means return unto the one from whom you so grievously departed, surrender yourself afresh to his lordship, render to him that wholehearted obedience which he requires. Make the pleasing of Christ your chief concern, walking with Him your daily business, communing with Him your supreme joy. Re-engage in the fight of faith, take unto you the armor which God has appointed, and give no quarter to your foes. Be diligent in using the means of grace, prayer, the reading of the Word, spiritual meditation thereon, and communing with God's people. Express your gratitude for the Lord's pardoning mercy and restoring grace by now being out and out for Him. He restoreth my soul is at once followed by He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Psalm 23.3 And do the first works then signifies Return to God in Christ. As our departure from the Lord was the cause of all our woes, so our case admits of no remedy till we repent and turn again unto Him. It is blessedly true that Christ purchased grace and pardon for His people, yet 
These are communicated to them in a way which is becoming to His holiness and wisdom. It would not be for His honor that we should be pardoned and restored without a penitent confession of past sins and an honest resolution of future obedience. Our case is not compassionable without it. Who will pity those in misery that are unwilling to come out of it? The sincerity of our repentance is to be evidenced by a hearty determination for the future to live in obedience. In other words, it is not enough that we cease to do evil. We are also required to learn to do well. Isaiah 1, 16 and 17 And do the first works. It is not sufficient to bemoan the follies of the past. Time present must be redeemed. As there are some sensible of their backslidings who do not actually repent thereof, so there are others who bemoan their sad case, yet languish in idle complaints for their lack of love and make no efforts to recover the same by serious endeavors. Those who are guilty of spiritual decays must not rest until they regain their former mindfulness of God and devotedness to Christ. Spare no efforts in so yielding up thyself to the Lord that His interests may again prevail in your heart above all sinful solicitations and vile inclinations. Engage your heart afresh to Christ. Make no reservation. Let your work be sin-abhorring and sin-resisting each day. And do the first works. When an Azarite had broken his vow, he had to start all over again. Number 612. When we have forsaken the narrow way of obedience to and communion with Christ, God requires us to return to the point from which we wandered. Thus, it was with the father of all who believe. Abraham's descent into Egypt was a divergence from the path of faith and duty. And what was the consequence? This, the time he spent there was lost, and he had to return to the point from whence he swerved and began over again. And he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Aah, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. Genesis 13, verses 3 and 4. Observe well the order which God has specified for the recovery of those who had left their first love. Perhaps we may grasp the force of it better if we transpose it. Do the first works. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Colossians 2.6 Ah, but do not overlook the fact that repent must precede this renewed activity in the Lord's service. The past must be put right before we can again enjoy real communion with Him. God will not gloss over our sins, nor will He suffer us to do so. They are to be judged, confessed, forsaken, before new obedience is acceptable to Him. And repent is, in turn, preceded by, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. The more we heed this injunction, the quicker will our conscience be convicted, and the deeper will be our contritions. Oh, that it may please the Lord to bless this chapter to the recovery of some backsliders. Part 6 We would ask our readers to please bear with us for writing further on the present aspect of our many-sided subject, namely, the restoration to fellowship with Christ of a backslidden believer. The need for it appears to us so pressing that we feel constrained to make another effort toward helping some of our brethren and sisters who have fallen by the wayside. How many there are who, for a year or two, seem very earnest and zealous in the Christian life, and then, 
become cold and careless, semi-worldly, or weighted down with the cares of this life. Frequently, such cases settle down in a state of partial despair. They feel that they are utter failures and conclude that daily communion with Christ is not for such as they. Instead of humbly confessing their failures to the Lord and trustfully seeking pardon and fresh supplies of grace, they go halting and mourning the rest of their days. We greatly fear that there are not a few of God's dear children who, to a greater or less degree, are held captives by the devil and are largely ignorant of the means for recovery. It is the duty of God's servants to seek out such and acquaint them with the provisions of divine grace, not to make light of sin and excuse backsliding, but to faithfully and tenderly point out how much Christ is being dishonored and what they are losing by their conduct, and then to set forth the means which God has appointed for their restoration, particularly emphasizing the fact we have a great high priest who has compassion on them that are out of the way, Hebrews 5.2, and is willing and able to save unto the uttermost them that come to God by him, Hebrews 7.25. Perhaps one of our readers says, But the Lord has turned away from me the light of his countenance, and therefore I have much reason to fear that I am not in his favor. Such an objection is answered in the charter of grace. I will not turn away from doing them good. Jeremiah 32.40 The Lord has withheld from thee his smile, his comforts, and thou art troubled about it. But that very trouble is for good. It should put thee upon inquiring into the reason for his strangeness toward thee. It should humble thee. It should bring thee into the dust before him in sincere and contrite confession. And then thou shouldst exercise thy faith on such a scripture as this. For the iniquity of his covetousness was I wroth and smote him. I hid me and was wroth and He went on forwardly in the way of his heart. I have seen his ways and will heal him. I will lead him also and restore comforts unto him. Isaiah 57, verses 17 and 18. It was fatherly chastisement which smote thee, but his love is unchanged and he is ready to heal and comfort. Perhaps another fears that God has not only hidden his face, but has quite forsaken him. He may have done so to thy sense and feeling, yet not so as to his own gracious purpose, which changeth not. Hear how he speaks to thee, distressed one. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. Isaiah 54, 7 and 8 How that should silence thy doubts! How gracious is thy God! How infinitely merciful was it that he should give thee such promises, so suited to thy needs, thy case! How well fitted is such a word as this to preserve thee under the trials of faith and to bring thee out of them. Read it over and over until the clouds of unbelief are dispersed and thou art again assured that God has a loving and royal welcome for every returning prodigal. But possibly there is a reader who says, My case is much more desperate. God is incensed against me, and justly so. He has cast me off, and I can expect no more favor at his hands. Once indeed I thought that he loved me, and that I loved him. But I have fouled my garments, fallen into great sin, disgraced my profession. 
my conscience accuses me of being a dog which has returned to his vomit. I deliberately flouted my privileges, sinned against light and conviction, and I am very guilty of that which is not to be found in the truly regenerate. Ah, dear friend, sad indeed, as is such a case, yet your language is not that of a reprobate. Thou art fallen into the mire, but are you determined to remain there? You are under a load of guilt, but wilt thou nurse it and so add sin to sin? No matter how vile thy fall, thou canst not be truly humbled for it until thou turnest to God and trustest the plenteous redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Let us anticipate a possible objection at this point. Is it altogether wise to speak so freely of the relief available for even a desperate case? None but a self-righteous Pharisee would ask such a question. Therefore, it is hardly deserving of any answer at all. But for the sake of any who may be perturbed by such a question, let it be pointed out that there is no subject revealed in Scripture, but that the wicked may pervert it. Second Peter 3.16 No matter how carefully the truth be presented, how God the language used, how well balanced the presentation, those who are determined to do so will rest it to their own destruction. It is a great pity that some of God's servants do not recognize this fact more clearly and act accordingly. They are so afraid that a wrong use may be made of what they say, or that their teaching may be denounced as dangerous, that they are muzzled, and often hold back a most needful and precious part of the children's bread. Let us not attempt to be wiser than the Holy Spirit. He hesitates not to tell forth the riches of divine grace unto the most notorious sinners and the worst backsliders. My little children, these write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. First John 2, 1, here is a guide for us. First, there is a presentation of the exalted standard which God sets before His people, a pressing of the requirements of His holiness. Second, there is a plain declaration of God's gracious provision for those who sadly fail to measure up to His standard, announcing the freeness of divine mercy. This is the order for us to follow, and this is the balance which we are to observe. First, a stressing of God's unchanging claims with His hatred of all sin, and then the recounting of the gracious provision made for His failing people. If any one of His children sin, not they are cast off by God and forfeit their salvation, but they have an advocate with the Father. Not but the apprehension of this latter fact will melt the backslider's heart. So it is all through the Scriptures. Take Numbers chapter 6, which treats of Nazarite dedication to God. There we have in type the highest form of separation from carnal delights and devotedness to the Lord. Yet even here, we find God anticipating failure and providing for it. And if any man die very suddenly by him, and he hath defiled the head of his consecration, then he shall shave his head, and so forth. Verses 9 to 12. God knows what we are even after our regeneration, and that there is never a day passes but what we need his pardoning mercy. He knows that while we are left down here, there will always be sin to be confessed, judged, forgiven, and put away. And therefore, while He never lowers the requirements of His holiness, yet His grace is ever found amply sufficient 
for his failing people's need, even though that very need be the result of their sins. The preacher is never to excuse sin or lightly regard the declension of saints. Yet he must not fail to make clear and present rich and full provision, which a gracious and compassionate God has made for those that wander from him. As a further example of what has just been said, let us for a while consider together the precious contents of Hosea 14, verses 1 to 6. O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Take with you words, and turn to the Lord, say unto him, Take away all iniquity, and receive us graciously. So will we render the calves of our lips. Asher shall not save us. We will not ride upon horses. Neither will we say any more to the works of our hands. Ye are our gods. For in thee the fatherless findeth mercy. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. For mine anger is turned away from him. I will be as the Jew unto Israel. He shall grow as the lily, and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. His branches shall spread, and his beauty shall be as the olive tree, and his smell as Lebanon. This passage belongs as truly unto spiritual Israel today, as it applied to natural Israel in the past. Romans 15, 4, 1 Corinthians 10, 11. The name Israel is used in Scripture with varying latitude. It has a wider scope when employed nationally and a narrower when used spiritually. It belongs to all the fleshly descendants of Jacob, but it had a special force unto the elect remnant among them. Inside the nation as a whole were Israelites indeed. John 1.47 concerning whom it was said, Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. Psalm 73.1 This distinction is clearly recognized in the New Testament, for he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. Romans 2.28 and 29 Behold Israel after the flesh, 1 Corinthians 10.18, which clearly implies there is another Israel after the Spirit. It has helped the writer much to perceive that the nation of Israel in Old Testament times was a type of Christendom as a whole, and that the godly remnant in that nation foreshadowed the little flock of the regenerate amid the great mass of professing Christians. O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Hosea 14.1 These words, then, had a wider and a narrower application. They were addressed first to the nation as a whole. They were spoken, secondly, to saved individuals in the nation. Hosea prophesied in very dark times. He lived during the reign of wicked Jeroboam, of whom it is said so often, he caused Israel to sin. And while Uzziah, Jotham, and Ahab were over Judah, idolatry was rampant. Yet 7,000 had been preserved from bowing the knee to Baal. History has repeated itself. For our lot is cast in a day when spiritual idolatry is sadly rife, and when many of God's own people are infected and affected by the evil spirit which is abroad. There is much in Hosea 14 which is truly pertinent and of great practical importance for us now. Once we get beneath the different figures there used, their spiritual significance will be readily seen. O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. How blessedly has God here revealed his desire 
for backsliders to return unto himself. The manner in which this call is given is very impressive and heart-melting. O is a note of exclamation. It is like one who has done much to help an indigent friend, now surprised and grieved at his base requital, saying, O John, or a devoted husband saying to his unfaithful spouse, O wife, so God says to those for whom he had done so much, and whose waywardness he has borne with such patience, O Israel. It is a note of exclamation addressed to their affections. God does not barely say, Israel, return unto me, still less does he gruffly command them so to do, but he tenderly entreats them, O Israel, return, what love that expresses. The backslider must seriously examine his condition and solemnly consider his sad plight. He has forsaken the paths of righteousness unless he retraces his steps. What will his end be? Let him heed then this divine injunction. Return. The Hebrew word is very emphatic, yet difficult to reproduce in English. Return even unto or Quite up to, is the thought, no partial return will satisfy his heart. Return unto the Lord thy God, unto him who has taken thee into covenant relationship with himself, who has shown thee such favors, unto him who alone can do thee any real good. Return unto the one whom thou hast so grievously wronged so excuselessly insulted by allowing forbidden objects to draw away thy heart from him. For thou had fallen by thine iniquity into spiritual sloth, into sickness of soul, into a joyless state, out of which none but God can lift you. Then return to him, for none but he can pardon, cleanse, heal, deliver you from the toils of Satan, but what is meant by return unto the Lord thy God? First of all, it denotes that the backslider honestly and solemnly faced the fact that he has departed from the Lord, that he has followed the evil devices of his own heart, yielded to the temptations of the devil, entered forbidden paths. Second, it signifies that he must now consider his ways and cease to do evil. Third, it implies that he judge himself unsparingly for his folly and wickedness, taking sides with God against himself. Fourth, it means that he must humble himself before God, acknowledging his transgressions, confessing his unworthiness, earnestly seeking the divine mercy. Finally, it includes the setting of his affections again on things above, diligently seeking grace to live as becometh a child of God. It is not difficult for us to write down what is intended by a return to the Lord, but it is far from easy for a backslider to carry it out. Satan will make a strenuous effort to retain his victim if he can no longer allure him with his baits. He will seek to drive him to despair with his accusations, telling him that he has sinned away the day of grace, that he has committed the great transgression, that his case is quite hopeless. Unto any such who may read these lines, let us say, Abraham, the father of the faithful, fell into this same sin again and again. David transgressed very grievously. Peter, though definitely forewarned, denied his master, yet they recovered themselves out of the snare of the devil. Remember it is written, The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Read through Hosea chapter 13 and note well the condition of Israel at that time. 
They were guilty of great wickedness and under the threatening of divine wrath. Yet to them came this tender appeal, O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God. How that shows us there are no seasons or circumstances which shall obstruct sovereign grace when God is pleased to exercise it toward his erring people. There is a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. Zechariah 13.1 That fountain possesses an infinite virtue to wash away every spot and stain of sin. It is a public fountain standing available for daily use that befouled believers may wash therein. Does not God say to his erring people, Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more? Hebrews 10.17 Then why reject the comfort of such a promise? It is perfectly suited to thy present distress and is the remedy. Take with you words and turn to the Lord. Say unto him, Take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. Hosea 14.2 So desirous is God that his backslidden people turn to him. He here dictates a prayer for their use. The injured one instructs them. Here God graciously makes known the means of recovery. For so ignorant are we of the way of return that we have to be told what to do. We know not what we should pray for as we ought. Romans 8.26 Yet, simple as the remedy appears, it is far from easy to carry out. As a child is slow to acknowledge its naughtiness, so pride of heart in a backslider makes him reluctant to own his iniquities. Alas, how many postpone their restoration by delaying their confession. Yet it is to their own great loss and harm that they refuse to acknowledge their sins. The worse be our case, the greater is our need of coming to Christ. On a bitterly cold day, the genial heart of a fire can only be enjoyed by our drawing near to it. We cannot bask in the warmth of Christ's love while we determine to remain away from him. Hence, the O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, of Hosea 14.1, is at once followed by, take with you words and turn to the Lord. No empty words will suffice. The whole soul must go out to God, so that out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. The one who is conscious that he has left his first love and has a real purpose to return to the Lord, must definitely look to the Holy Spirit to work in his heart the substance of this prayer so that it truly voices his deep desires. But why does God order that we take with us words? Is he not fully acquainted with the thoughts and intents of our hearts? Yes, but he requires us to humble ourselves beneath his mighty hand, to take unto ourselves the shame of our fall, to stir us up to feel the enormity of our crimes. Say unto him, Take away all iniquity. This is what is to deeply exercise the penitent's heart, that which has so grievously dishonored the Lord befouled his own garments and occasioned such a stumbling block unto his fellows. Repentance is to act itself in prayer, requesting that God will do for us what we cannot do for ourselves, either remove the guilt and defilement of our sins or subdue their raging within. Take away the love of, the bondage of, the pollution of, from heart, conscience, and life. Take away all iniquity. There must be no reservation. All sin is equally burdensome and hateful to a penitent soul. And receive us graciously. 
faith must individualize it and say, Receive me graciously. Deal with me not according to my evil deserts, but according to thine infinite mercy. Look upon the atoning blood and pardon me. Regard me no longer with displeasure, but grant me fresh tokens of thy favor and acceptance. So will we render the calves of our lips, that is, offer praise unto thee. Hebrews 13.15 The order is unchangeable. Only as the backslider returns to the Lord, humbles himself before him, repents of his sins, seeks his forgiveness, is he experimentally fitted to be a worshipper once more. God will not accept praise of rebels. Asher shall not save us. We will not ride upon horses, neither will we say any more to the work of our hands, Ye are our gods, for in thee the fatherless findeth mercy. Verse 3 The force of these words can best be understood by reading Hosea 5, verse 13, 7, verse 11, 8, 8 and 9, and 12, verse 1. Horses were what the unbelieving Hebrews put their trust in during times of war. Fleshly confidence and idolatry were their two worst sins, and here they are confessed and disowned. So we must acknowledge and renounce in detail our sins. The fatherless are those conscious of their deep need, helplessness, dependency. O oh, turn to him and find the Lord a very present help in trouble. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. Hosea 14, verse 4 This is ever God's response to a returning backslider who penitently confesses his sins and truly desires to be delivered from a repetition of them. Sin is a disease which wounds the soul, and only God can heal it. When He loves us freely, He manifests Himself to us. John 14.21 I will be as the dew unto Israel. He shall grow as the lily. Verse 5 Dew comes from above, falls insensibly, cooling the air, refreshing vegetation, making fruitful. It is a beautiful figure of the Spirit's renewing the restored believer, granting him fresh supplies of grace. The lily speaks of lowliness, purity, fragrance, and cast forth his roots as Lebanon, verse 5, that is, be more firmly fixed in the love of Christ, and so less easily swayed by the customs of the world and assaults of Satan. His beauty shall be as the olive tree, useful and fruitful, and his smell, the fragrance he emits, as Lebanon. Verse 6. A restored Christian is a joy to God's servants and an encouragement to his brethren. See verse 7. Others are encouraged to return. Oh, what inducements are here set before the backslider to turn to the Lord. Yet faith must be exercised so as to appropriate the precious promises of verses 4 through 8. Chapter 10 Glory Union This present life, with its continual mixture of good and evil, joy and sorrow, with its constant fluctuations and disappointments, naturally prompts a reflecting mind to the belief and hope of a future life that will be more perfect and permanent, yet that is as far as the unaided intellect can project us. A divine revelation is indispensable if we are to learn how heaven is to be reached and of what its blessedness consists. By the fall of the first Adam, paradise was lost, And only through the last Adam can sinners be restored unto God, and only by the supernatural operations of the Spirit can the hearts of depraved men be fitted for 
and their steps be directed along the sole way which conducts to the mansions in the Father's house. Vain is human reasoning, worthless the efforts of imagination when it comes to obtaining a knowledge of that antitypical Canaan which flows with spiritual milk and honey. This Reformation audio track is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books. SWRB makes thousands of classic Reformation resources available, free and for sale, in audio, video, and printed formats. Our many free resources, as well as our complete mail-order catalog, containing thousands of classic and contemporary Puritan and Reform books, tapes, and videos at great discounts, is on the web at www.stillwater.com swrb.com. We can also be reached by email at swrb at swrb.com, by phone at 780-450-3730, by fax at 780-468-1096, or by mail at 4710-37A Avenue, Edmonton, that's E D. M-O-N-T-O-N, Alberta, abbreviated capital A, capital B, Canada, T6L3T5. You may also request a free printed catalog. And remember that John Calvin, in defending the Reformation's regulative principle of worship, or what is sometimes called the scriptural law of worship, commenting on the words of God, which I commanded them not, neither came into my heart, from his commentary on Jeremiah 7.31, writes, God here cuts off from men every occasion for making evasions, since he condemns by this one phrase, I have not commanded them, whatever the Jews devised. There is then no other argument needed to condemn superstitions than that they are not commanded by God. For when men allow themselves to worship God according to their own fancies, and attend not to his commands, they pervert true religion. And if this principle is adopted by the Papists, all those fictitious modes of worship in which they absurdly exercise themselves would fall to the ground. It is indeed a horrible thing for the Papists to seek to discharge their duties towards God by performing their own superstitions. There is an immense number of them, as it is well known, and as it manifestly appears. Were they to admit this principle, that we cannot rightly worship God except by obeying his word, they would be delivered from their deep abyss of error. The prophet's words, then, are very important when he says that God had commanded no such thing and that it never came to his mind, as though he had said that men assume too much wisdom when they devise what he never required, nay, what he never knew.